as we're waiting, we have a very short video for you all. If you enjoy the Dole Institute of Politics events, these events couldn't be accomplished without our friends of the Dole Institute. If you would like to become a friend, please refer to the brochure on your seat for step-by-step -step instructions for joining. Members get special benefits like invitations to pre-events, social luncheons, and reserved seating. We hope you'll consider becoming a friend of the Institute. Thank you and enjoy the 2014 post-election conference. Well, I know that that was a little hard to hear, and I wanted to take just a minute to draw all of your attention to the Friends of the Dole Institute brochures on your chairs. Uh, but I know that most of you here are already friends, so that is wonderful. Um, we do have our annual dinner this evening out over at the Lead Center, and I know many of you are coming. Um, but any, if any of you would like to join us this evening with our panelists and want to become friends, I do still have a couple of spots open. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for your support of the Institute, and we will get started with our panel just shortly. And I don't think she introduced herself, but that was Clarissa Unger, who runs our, is our development coordinator and runs our Friends program and does a very good job, I might add. We'll be starting in just a couple minutes. We'll start with a question on the political environment. And I'm not directing it at anybody, so when you hear the question, somebody be ready to jump. <laughs> Let's go Lawrence, we're we about a minute off. Okay, I'll give it 20 seconds. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. I'm Bill Lacey, the director of the Institute. We're delighted that you could join us for what is going to be a fascinating discussion uh, over the next two days about the elections that just uh, occurred nationally. We had a fabulous discussion this morning of the Kansas elections, which I hope most of you were able to make because it was spirited and entertaining and also very enlightening. And uh, I think the discussion that you're going to hear over the next two days from our group of panelists uh, will be uh, most enlightening as well. We've got a couple announcements to make. We'll resume with our second session tomorrow morning at 9.30, and the uh, uh, third and final session will be after a 30-minute break, and it will occur at 11.30 tomorrow. Um, please, right now, turn off your cell phones. If you have a cell phone on, please turn it off or, uh, so that we don't have phones going off during the discussion. We'll do a Q&A session. Uh, for the audience immediately uh, at the end of the session. Uh, I would ask everyone, please ask a question, no speeches. Um, we had a little bit of a problem with that this morning. I know everybody's passionate about the elections, but we really want to maximize the opportunity for individuals to ask questions. We want to give everyone a chance. We didn't get as much time for Q&A this morning as we possibly could. Uh, because we want to maximize this time for discussion, we've got handouts for you that have the full biographies of our panelists, and I'm not going to uh, give them formal introductions other than just to greet them. Um, Rob Collins, who's the executive director of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, to my left. Nathan Klein, polling and analytics director, Senatorial Campaign Committee. Alex Eisenstadt, Politico. Joe Linsky, executive vice president of Edison. Joe is the one panelist who has been at every post-election conference because he has the exit poll data, and that is always <laughs> one of the popular topics. So, Joe, thanks for coming back. Thank you. Sean Trin, who's a senior elections analyst at Real Clear Politics, and who also, if I remember, you told me that you clerked for Judge Donnell Ta here in Lawrence for a while, many years ago. 2001 to 2002. Yeah, well, Sean, welcome back. To my right, Raul, you probably didn't expect me to say to my right, coming from a Republican, <laughs> but... <laughs> 
Raul Alvillar, who is the National Political Director of the Democratic National Committee. We have Dan Baltz, an old friend who's been to one of these conferences before, who is the Chief Correspondent for the Washington Post. A good friend of mine, John McLaughlin, who's the CEO partner of McLaughlin & Associates, a Republican polling firm. I was originally going to put you on the left side so I could say you were to my left, John, but I knew you wouldn't like that. And Patrick O'Connor, who is a political reporter at the Wall Street Journal, was recommended uh, for the conference by our good friend, KU graduate Jerry Seib, who heads the Washington Bureau. And Jen O'Malley Dillon, who's a partner with Precision Strategies and is a Democratic strategist. Please welcome our panelists to the Dole Institute and the University of Kansas. We're going to do these three sessions in roughly chronological order. They'll, they'll vary a little bit. You'll have some uh, spillover from one to the other. But I do want to try to cover today, uh, in the next hour and a half, kind of the setup more than anything else to the elections. And so I want to start by just resetting and have everybody who wants to jump in on this, but kind of reset where we were in, 20, 000, in January 2013. The president had just won a stunning re-election. Republicans had, had lost an election that they thought, at least uh, a lot of us thought, that uh, Governor Romney was going to win. Uh, the president's job approval, according to Gallup, and I'll be using Gallup numbers over the next two days, by the way, so when I cite survey data, it's from Gallup. Uh, Gallup had his job approval at 53-42. Given these factors, in January 2013, what kind of election year did our panelists anticipate in 2014? I could go first. Um, you know, when I started at the committee in January of 2013, we had a, a party that was on its heels, um, a Senate campaign committee that had a, had a good a cycle, um, but uh, there was just a sense that our candidates had underperformed. Um, so a lot of people called and said, you know, you're thinking about taking this job or you took this job, you know, what's your kind of rationale? And, you know, presidents have, in their midterms, second terms, have always lost seats. Um, I thought it was an opportunity there. I thought the map favored us. We had um, seven Democrat seats that were either open or uh, held by uh, incumbents that Romney had won. And six of those seats, Obama had gotten 42% or less. So um, I know folks sometimes discount history, but I'm a big believer in electoral history as kind of a good guidepost. It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get the results you wanted, but we had the conditions that were favorable. Um, I think our challenge in the short term was uh, how do we look at what we did, what we accomplished, and how do we build um, better campaigns? Uh, you know, campaigns are 18 to, uh, in North Carolina, $110 million operations <laughs> that are around on average 11 months, and they have one day of sales. And, you know, then they're gone. They poof, go, go into the ethos, and they're gone. Um, so there's no HR departments. There's no long-term planning. Um, but the committee has to play that role. So in the course of taking over in, in our first few months with uh, uh, Senator Moran, our, your fellow Kansan, um, you know, we did about 19 audits of the building. We brought in a traditional auditor, but we also brought in Google and Salesforce. And um, uh, we, we asked every candidate we had going back six years. We asked every campaign manager going back six years. We asked consultants who worked for us, consultants who never worked for us, uh, what we did right, what we did wrong. We sent out questionnaires. Um, op a lot of open-ended questions and, and asked a lot of questions. And this is going to be, for folks in politics, kind of a, a simple answer to a complex qu a question. But the answer we got back over and over again was uh, we needed better candidates. Um, the candidates were saying they didn't understand the business of being a candidate until it was too late in the cycle and they'd already made mistakes. And our opponents are very good and they're very thorough. And they research you and they think about how to attack, attack you. And um, they're very well funded, and small mistakes become huge mistakes, and bad habits become really bad habits as you get closer. So um, the first lesson we learned is we had to recruit good candidates. Not only candidates who can survive a primary, um, but survive a general election. Uh, we never looked at them through an ideological lens. So if Monica Webby wanted to be pro-gay marriage and pro-marijuana and pro-choice in Oregon, that was fine, because that's where, that's where that state was. She couldn't get elected in Arkansas, going to make it out of a primary in Arkansas, but she could win that race, and vice versa. Candidates in the South wouldn't have done well in Maine or Oregon or, or, or Minnesota, and on some, some and not all social, but other issues, trade. Um, we had to find candidates who fit their state, not, not fit a national 
DC perspective. Um, but we also had to train them. Uh, we spent endless hours, days upon days, training our candidates. We brought in top media trainers. We brought in uh, policy uh, folks who ran uh, huge policy think tanks came in and just talked to our candidates how to talk about the issues. We never told our candidates what to believe. Uh, if you're not authentic in politics in an age of instant everything, um, you get found out as a phony, and that's the worst thing to be to a voter. A, a voter would rather disagree with you but think you're, you have core convictions than think you're a phony. And so we never taught them what to believe. We just taught them how to talk about their issues. We put cameras on them. We prepared them. We talked to them about how to fundraise. We talked to them how to, how to build a modern campaign. And then the next step was to research. We spent a lot of money researching ourselves and researching our opponents. Um, from the moment you turned 18 to the moment you walked into the NRSC, we wanted to know everything you'd done because we knew the Democrats would know everything you'd done. And we had to have those honest conversations. Um, and then we trained them some more. We kept training them, kept training them. Um, you know, we put debate coaches in the field uh, September in the off year, not a week before the debate like we had traditionally, but 12, 13, 14 months um, we had debate teams, we had policy teams, we had polling teams going in and talking to our candidates over and over again. Um, like I said, it wasn't about what they believed. It was about making sure they didn't make mistakes. They knew how to talk about issues. They knew how to talk about tough issues. Um, and, um, and so that was our challenge. That was our mindset as we went in, which was basically we're going to build the best campaigns we can find. We're going to modernize them. We're going to focus on digital. We're going to focus again on, on ground game. You know, the Republican Party used to be great at ground game, and we'd gotten away from it the last couple of years, the last couple of cycles. Um, so we made a commitment, and every time we talked to a candidate, we said, we don't want you to build your campaign from the TV commercial backwards. Oh, we have, to, we have to have money for TV. We want you to build your campaigns from ground game backwards, from um, digital backwards, uh, getting your people out. We want you to invest in human beings, asking fellow human beings, citizens, asking citizens to vote for you. Um, the TV, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out, but let's get the fundamentals right. And I think it was really impactful and it changed the nature of our campaigns. Um, and the last thing I would say is our mindset, and it, it comes from a slide in February 2013. I walked into a room of 500 donors or prospective donors, and they really challenged us as people who had invested in the committee uh, to do a better job. And um, so we came up with a business plan. Senator Portman, Senator Moran, you know, the committee came up with a business plan on how we we're going to conduct ourselves. And one thing we said, and it's something that I, I keep repeating because I think it was largely unsatisfactory to the Washington um, pundits that we didn't have a contract with America or a central unifying document was, we're not, these races are going to nationalize, but we're not going to nationalize our candidates. And it's right there in the slide deck from February 2013. It's something we believed in, which is when there was a local issue, we were going to talk about that local issue. 2012, we had a candidate who was attacked for suing his fire department, volunteer fire department. His response, Obamacare. The next, they attacked him saying a veteran uh, called an email them asking for help and he didn't get back to him. His response, Obamacare. And then there was uh, another scandal that broke and the, the response was Obamacare. So the, the Democrats were talking about local issues, that, things that people cared about. And the Republicans were talking about these national issues. Well, we always knew the national discussion was going to happen. We had a president who was, at the time, in the high 40s, but we figured his numbers had only one place to go, which was down. And uh, we had a, par a national Democrat party um, that was saddled with all these massive things, Obamacare, the economy, foreign policy. But we also knew that the Democrats are very good about localizing races, and we didn't want us to get too separated from that issue. So that's why you saw Tom Tillis in North Carolina talk about education. That's why you saw uh, Tom Cotton and Joni Ernst talk about Social Security and the commitment to uh, uh, retirees and people who paid. And you saw Dan Sullivan talk about teacher pension funds in Alaska. Um, because uh, we knew the outside groups and even the NRSC would talk about big national issues. But if we keep everyone focused locally, we thought we'd, we'd be able to compete um, with uh, Democrat incumbents who had spent the last six years being local. Um, so that was kind of our mindset. Sorry for the long opening. No, no, that, that's very good. And I want to stay on this theme for just a second if I can, so bear with me, everybody, here a minute. Uh, I want to stay on the theme of the parties and kind of the, 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 the different party strategies, what you guys felt about going into it and kind of the planning that you did. But, Nathan, is there anything you want to add to what Rob said about uh, what the Senate com committee was doing in terms of that early part of the cycle? Well, in the most, the very early part of the cycle, I had not yet joined the committee. Um, but as I came on, there was a clear 
a clear pivot that we were making um, as a committee, a decision that Rob had made, um, that the other people there at the committee had made to have a more robust data operation, a polling operation, to bring some of those things in-house in a way that we could rely on it and work with a number of people. Something that we learned is one source of data is never good enough no matter what. Um, so you have to have multiple voices and you have to find the truth and all of that clutter. Um, and as we came on, uh, the only thing that Rob probably wouldn't say about himself is a lot of this early on in the cycle probably came more from the gut than it did from the numbers in terms of the potential for the success. And Rob and Ward Baker and the other senior guys there really believed it and really willed a lot of these opportunities into being. Um, when I looked out at the cycle, I didn't necessarily see all of the success that we had. I saw a path to potentially a majority in the Senate, um, but it certainly did not reach the levels that we reached come election day. And a lot of these guys who believed early, data can take you a long, long way, but it can only point you in a direction. Um, and there was a lot early in the cycle, there was a lot of belief, there was a lot of faith, and there was a lot of willingness into being that happened from the party perspective based also on the uh, historical perspective that Rob mentioned. I mean, to a certain point, you can't judge on any one day the number that I just saw, what's going to happen a year and a half from now or two years from now. Um, and so I, I do want to give a lot of credit to the people who built the campaign early on. Um, fortunately, things had already started looking better by the time I got there, so it was a much uh, <laughs> rosier picture. I didn't have to tell them that until after we had won the races. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I want to switch to the Democratic perspective. and. Uh, Raul, you are the political director at the National Committee. Jen, I think you did some, your firm did some work with various candidates in the, the Senate Committee. What were you guys thinking when you started the cycle? What did you feel was achievable and what were you trying to do? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're going to hear a lot of similarities uh, of some of the things that we were thinking about. I served as a senior advisor to the DSCC. So I worked in all the competitive Senate races and we came into the cycle you know, we knew the map was against us. We knew history was against us. We obviously recognized that from a national perspective, um, it was a, a, a tough terrain uh, for our candidates. Um, but we also had very strong incumbents who were well known, were um, very strong locally, and we knew we had a lot to build on. We felt from the beginning that we had to think about how to support these candidates differently than the committee had ever done before from a Senate perspective. And I think that in some ways we were up against a challenge coming out of the Obama campaign and experience, and I, I was on that campaign too. There, there was an idea that only Obama could do what he did, uh, and only Obama could build the campaign that he built, um, and that was a very unique moment in time, and certainly that was the case, but there were uh, opportunities there and, and best practices and, and uh, ideas for, for building these campaigns in a successful way that are very transferable. Um, and, and the core of what we wanted to do was take those best practices and apply them to the campaigns, but in very uh, specific ways, so that we weren't running a national campaign, this wasn't a national campaign, and we were building very unique campaigns in each state, and within each state, um, you know, building unique campaigns in each community. So we started very early doing something the committee had never done, which is spending a lot of resources on um, using data modeling, um, techniques to um, really understand the electorate better. And that was really important for us because a lot of the states that we were um, competing in were not traditional presidential battleground states. They were not places that over the last couple of cycles there was a lot of organization on the ground or uh, volunteer activity or an understanding of where the electorate was. So we spent a lot of time making sure we understood the data but then building very unique pathways to victory in each state and within there in each community. And from there we determined what our campaign and our programs needed to look like. And I think that discipline allowed us to build the type of campaign where we put ourselves in the best position for success. Obviously, uh, I'm not uh, sitting here today feeling uh, as, as good about how things went as Rob. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we can look at the experience that we had, and I think you will see in each of these campaigns a very robust effort, whether it was about uh, paid advertising, or it was about the ground game, or it was about um, digital communications. And to be successful in modern day campaigning, you have to do all of those things, and you have to do them in concert with each other, and in, in, um, in synchronizing that. You can't go back to an old model of uh, Senate races or midterm elections where it's about TV, uh, or it's about late uh, GOTV work um, and, and um, you know, final putting all your money in places like broadcast. That's just not the way you're going to win anymore. So I think we saw the most sophisticated um, Senate races in the midterm that we'd ever seen. 
we certainly saw the most localized on the Democratic side. We certainly saw um, the most um, robust and for the first time using some of these tactics from a presidential perspective and putting it on the ground in a Senate race. So I think there are a lot of really important lessons that we learned and a lot of strong takeaways that we have. Um, clearly, uh, we didn't pull it all together in a way that allowed us to win. Um, but I think the, the opportunity there and, and the direction of where campaigns are going have a lot um, coming out of this experience that we continue to an analyze, but I think um, we're able to take things to the, the next level and do a lot of the things that uh, Rob and his team did. Raul? Right, and I, I, I would just add to that that, um, you know, at the party we, we, we take a very um, interesting role during the midterms. Um, you know, uh, the DCCC, the D, uh, you know, the Democratic Senator Senatorial Committee, uh, is, is, is playing a, a significant role and what we try to do is we try to support as much as we can. Um, and we also developed uh, what we call the four pillars uh, for, for the Democratic Party and, and we kind of adhere to those and, and, and some of those pillars are uh, uh, where we really believe in strengthening state parties uh, because that's where a lot of the work gets done. Uh, that's, that's where all our soldiers are. Uh, and, and, you, and the folks on the ground are the ones that are going to be able to help us um, determine what some of these uh, local messages can be so that way we can get our candidates talking about them, uh, so on and so forth. I came up through the, straight, through the uh, state party, so it's a big uh, belief for me that, that state parties are crucial to this, to this process and, and, and having strong parties is, is key. Uh, the other thing that we uh, wanted to make sure uh, that we did was we had voter, uh, voter expansion and we had a, a team that just focused on that uh, to make sure that we're getting um, of people uh, registered to vote uh, and making sure that we're expanding the vote. Uh, and, and once we actually get those people registered to vote and once we uh, have identified who, who would be a Democrat after they declare, um, making sure that we protect that vote and making sure that you know, they have the opportunity to go vote and, and, and you know, don't have to use an ID or uh, whatever it might be. Um, the other thing that uh, we uh, at the Democratic Party really um, really, really uh, foster is, uh, is our data and digital. Um, we have what we call Project Ivy, uh, and that's uh, where we have all of the data. We have the data from uh, the 08 race, we have the data from, uh, from 12, um, from 10, and now we have all the, the data that we're gonna be gath gathering now for, for uh, 14, and making sure that we're scrubbing, making sure we understand uh, the, the, the data, and then also, uh, using you know analytics and modeling to further um, broaden our, our voter uh, base. Uh, so we, we, we have a big emphasis on that. Uh, the other thing that we also really focus on too is, is, is uh, our factivist program and making sure that people um, are getting the correct information uh, uh, whenever there's something that, uh, that comes out in the news that might not be entirely factual or uh, would be the opposite. And so we uh, make sure, it's a play on words of the activists, but we call it so that we get the facts out to our, to our people that are on the ground to make sure uh, that uh, they have that type of information. Uh, and so, you know, with all that said, you know, these, these are the things that we were hoping with, you know, at the time that, that these were all going to help us uh, get the outcome that we hoped for. And as Jen said, it, was, it wasn't the case, but um, these are some of the things that we really embody and that we really uh, want to, to, to further as we continue to, to move on. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some responses from the rest of you. I mean, very clearly one of the themes that we've already heard today is, you know, no matter what you do in an individual campaign, the national environment has an effect. And, um, but go back to January of 2013 and give me kind of some of your assessments, what you thought was gonna transpire during this election, well, Sean? This isn't, I'm gonna break the rule and jump to July. Um, okay, but, that's uh, all right, Sean. Well, only because I actually have hard data on this. I, I had written a piece, it was right after Brian Schweitzer uh, announced that he wasn't going to run for Senate in Montana, and I wrote a piece. Uh, Barack Obama was about a 50% job approval at the time, and I wrote a piece saying, you know, with this, there's probably a 30% chance uh, that Republicans take the Senate. There's a path, but it's not likely. Um, and Nate Cohn, uh, then at the New Republic, actually wrote pretty much the exact same piece on the same day. Uh, we, we both saw kind of 30 percent. Nate Silver, of course, at 538 was uh, a little higher than that, thought maybe a 40 percent chance. And so we, we never agree on anything, the three of us. And all of us kind of had the same basic feel for where things were, that yeah, Republicans had a, had a chance to getting six seats, but, but it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the likely outcome. Uh, and, and I think that's important as we 
kind of move forward in this discussion, is that if you look at the coverage um, of the 2014 elections, there's, there's a lot of fatalism in it. That, oh yeah, there's, a, there's demographic drop off and it was a tough map, so of course Republicans had a good night. Um, but but that's, that's not really how it works. Uh, if the president had maintained a 50% job approval rating through election day, I don't think Republicans would have taken the Senate. Uh, and like I said, as the evidence, three, three data guys who never see eye to eye kind of had that view when the president was at 50%. I'm, I'm totally with Sean. I felt like I spent most of 2013, and this is no surprise to Rob, thinking that, you know, history is on Republican side, but, uh, and the math may have been on their side, but the math was not, because he's listed seven seats that uh, Demo Democrats were representing seven seats that the president had lost. I don't know what handful by less than 42%, but it looked really good. The problem was is that they had to win six of the seven. Because at the time, that was the map. They basically had to get a straight flush in order to win the Senate majority, which given the state of the party at the time and given the fact that the president, uh, you know, he really, his numbers dipped dramatically in, I guess it would have been October of 2013. But for most of the year, they weren't great, but they weren't, they weren't terrible. And I think that we thought, because the, the Democrats had very solid incumbents, they, uh, excuse me, clearly understood, they, they showed us in 2012 that they understood the, the electorate in a much more sophisticated way than Republicans did, and I think Republicans learned a lot of lessons from that, but there was an evolution. And then there was another big impediment for Republicans, which was they were at war with each other. Uh, we saw it play out almost the entire year ending in the, the shutdown, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit too, but 13, it was just one fight after the other, and I, I covered Congress for eight years before I started really focusing more on, on broader political stories, and the House floor was a debacle. Uh, the most uh, benign bill was getting brought down by conservative, you know, 30 to 50 conservative Republicans, and we were seeing that exact same uh, dynamic play out in what was the early primary field in a lot of these competitive contests. And those forces, I really thought, were going to be damaging. And I think it is a credit to what the Senate Republicans were able to do to navigate that. But I guess we can get to that later. Uh, I, I just I will it cop to it, the election result may feel inevitable now, but I it was not until really late in the year till at well after the shutdown that I started to take the prospect seriously uh, of a Republican takeover of the Senate. What about some of the rest of, the, rest of you, the environment in 2013? Yeah, I, I wouldn't underestimate, though, how bad the math was for the Democrats. I mean, the 34 states that had Senate races this year, Romney actually won. If you take the popular vote from those 34 states, Romney won in a 2012 electorate in those 34 states, 50 to 48. So from the Senate point of view, the Republicans were starting on a better terrain than they had nationally in 2012, because states like California and New York don't have, didn't have Senate races in 2014. Um, and then a lot of these factors that looked compelling in 2013 just didn't turn out to be compelling. In incumbent status, especially Democratic incumbent status in Republican states, the, the just was not of the value that it had been in previous previous cycles, and we see this trend year after year after year that these races, uh, the, the straight party voting has increased and increased, and split tickets between a presidential race and a Senate race are in single digits now, and that didn't used to be the case in a lot of elections previously. So a lot of these factors that kind of clouded the judgment in 2013 didn't end up being anywhere near as important as they had been in previous cycles. I think that's an important point. I mean, if you, if you think about January of 2013, you're thinking about a president who's come off of quite successful re-election, um, who has come through that election in a much more aggressive posture, um, and is using, is trying to use that victory uh, to push an agenda. Uh, and Republicans, as Rob said, were divided and, and demoralized and, and in many ways at, at that early stage at least on the defensive um, and so it was a period of a number of months as different fights began to take shape I mean the first big setback for the president obviously was on the guns issue um, and that was an indication that despite his victory in the in the reelection campaign 
he was not necessarily going to have his way with Congress any better than he had had the previous two years. Uh, so that was an early marker that the dynamics were not going to be necessarily in his favor. Um, the passage of the immigration bill through the Senate um, was a moment at which you know, you could see both the divisions within the Republican Party and the problems that the Republicans might have with that issue, but also you could see a hardening on the Republican side and a coalescence uh, moving back away from where Republicans or a number of Republicans had been six or seven months earlier right after the election. Uh, the notion uh, of a party that was um, at that point relatively divided over whether there should be a path to legalization uh, or citizenship even at that point uh, evaporated by the time we got into the summer um, and then you know skip over the shutdown um, once you got to the debacle with health care then you had really begun to frame what 2014 was going to be about but for a lot of 2013 most people and certainly most voters were not thinking at all about Senate races. They were looking at kind of the dynamics nationally between the two parties uh, and the power of the president or lack of power of the president. Okay, Alex, you want to add something here? Yeah, you know, looking back at, at early uh, 2013, uh, I would say a lot of people thought that Republicans could potentially pick up the Senate. It wasn't something that everyone thought, but here's the thing, which is that we thought back in 2010, a lot of people thought Republicans could pick up the Senate. Uh, it didn't happen. They won the control of the House of Representatives, fell short in the Senate, and the reason why, I think Rob touched on this maybe a little bit, was because in 2014, Republicans succeeded in getting a really good batch of candidates to, uh, to win their nominations. In 2010, you had a lot of uh, you know, subpar Republican nominees because they lost to uh, t you know, less well-known Tea Party candidates in a lot of primaries, and uh, to Rob's credit, uh, and, and to the NRSC's credit, they succeeded in, in winning a lot of these primaries. And, and as I'm sure we're going to talk about at some point, uh, NRSC played a pretty uh, heavy hand in a lot of these primaries. So, um, you know, to, to a large extent, I do think that, that candidate quality really mattered uh, in, in terms of helping r Republicans win control of the Senate. Democrats knew they had a really bad hand to play in this election, uh, and they were hoping for Republicans to fumble the ball much as they did in primaries in 2010, and, and that didn't happen. Okay, and I want to come back to that a little bit later, uh, but I want to stay focused for just a, another minute or so on the environment. John, you're a Republican pollster. You do a lot of campaigns all over the country. Uh, what were you telling clients and potential clients, you know, in early to mid-2013 about the kind of cycle that, that you expected them to run in? Well, the difference, you know, since we go back, I used to work for Arthur Finkelstein. Arthur, when I worked for him for like nine years, he'd meet with a candidate and the candidate would tell him, oh, I've never lost a race. And he's like, that's terrible. And, he's ter and the reason he would say it's terrible is because you have no idea what you're doing wrong. The great thing about the last 2012 was the Republicans found out a lot about what we were doing wrong. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, like a lot of people were, you know, what was wrong with the polls? I'm like, Sean, your, your website, if you go, I used to point to people, we wrote a story about, like, your website, if you go to realclearpolitics.com, Obama was losing the election until the last weekend. And the average of, not my polls, but the average of all the media polls, he went like a point and a half ahead like the day before the, that weekend. And, and you and I have seen polls change dramatically in one day, one, one two nights. And uh, what it was worried about was who was coming out and why. Like Dan just talked about message. You know, before that, a lot of us talked about process. And when you think about why voters vote, the numbers that we were looking at, if you look at uh, 2012, you had 241 million voters who are voting age Americans. You had 220 million people eligible to vote. Out of the 220 million, only 130 million cast votes. And the president got 65 million, McCain got, I mean Romney, similar, got 61 million, which was down. And what I was focused on was, and you're going through 2013, I had plenty of candidates in Virginia We had the House of Delegates up. And I had eight of the toughest races in, in that state. You know, New Jersey, when we polled, polled for some independent groups, uh, Christie was going to win. It was, you know, he, he, was, he was, it was like a foregone conclusion. Even when his poor opponent had no money, he was beating up on her. <laughs> she was upside down before she even spent a nickel on ads. 
Um, so he won that 60-40. wasn't much there, but Virginia was more in play, particularly with the government shutdown. And what was interesting was when Dan went through the litany of events, I was thinking back to my Virginia polls for like we, we had eight of the House of Delegates and I was doing the, the delegate caucus polls. At the end, I had Barbara Comstock. And Comstock, she's like, oh my gosh, you know, Cuccinelli's got a 60 unfavorable in my district. What are we going to do? And I said, we would turn out people who are unfavorable to Obamacare, which we did. We did that in Russ district. We did in the other districts. And the turnout factor becomes a huge thing because instead of the three and a half million voters in Virginia, you were going to have two million. And, and you were going to have, uh, and the Republicans ultimately won 67 out of the 100 House of Delegate seats, which was, they only lost one incumbent and then won, in spite of all these bad things that were going to happen to us. And what we were always looking at was, of the 130 million that voted, you had 90 million turnout in 2010 for Congress or other statewide offices. So there were 40 million voters that, if, I, if I'm a Democrat, and I'm sure they did it, they just didn't tell me about it, but <laughs> they looked at who, who voted for President Obama in 2012 that they could get back out that they didn't vote in 2010. And 2010 was a really good election. Rob and I worked with the, uh, uh, Eric, uh, the whip then, Eric Hanner, and you could see the president started out 2009 after he got elected with a 71% approval rating. And then he gave us stimulus, a budget, and a health care plan the majority was against. He went upside down. And we had the most conservative electorate we've ever seen, like in our 20 years. I don't know about Joe and your polls, but 2010 was the most conservative electorate we'd seen probably ever in that midterm. But, but in 2012, we left conservatives home. There were 90 million people that voted, 130 million people, but it was less than 08, and we left people home. Romney didn't inspire people at the end, and the president certainly motivated his people in the last end according to insurance polls. This time around, when you're thinking that you're going to have a drop off of polling, you know, drop off of turnout, um, in spite of the fact you have more eligible voters, I mean, this time, you know, ultimately looking ahead, you had 246 million eligible voters. You had 227 million, I mean, 220, 246 million voting age population. You had 227 million eligible. And you only had 82 million people go out and cast votes for the highest office in that state. For Congress, you only had 78 million voters. The Republicans, we got, in the end, we got 40 million votes. That's 11 million less than what Romney got. And the, the Democrats for Congress got 36 million. That's a lot less than President Obama's 66 million. So, you know, you've got this lower turnout, and you've got, uh, it was better for the Republicans, but it still wasn't as good for us as 2010. And what I was talking about with candidates was trying to motivate early on reasons to get people to vote so that in a lower turnout, we would win. And ultimately, Comstock, she, what she did the year before, uh, for House of Delegates in 2014, she actually blew it out one by 16 points. I mean, it was it was similar kind of messages to get people out, um, and and different Republicans around the country were doing that. Rob was doing it in the Senate campaign. The House the House Republicans were doing it in the targeted races. Governors were doing it, and uh, I think you know when you look at we never knew the president in our polls among likely voters. We did a monthly national omnibus poll. He was upside down the whole year as far as we could see, and it looked like he was- In 2013? In 2013 and 2014, but it got bigger, a little bigger, okay. more pronounced, yeah. but among likely voters that you thought were gonna vote. And we, we were doing it monthly. And what was interesting, the generic vote, and we wrote about this several times in 2014, was dead even. Point up Democrats, point up Republicans. The difference was the undecideds, two thirds of them were disapproved the job the president was doing, but they also didn't like the Republicans and they also blame both parties for the mess in Washington. You're getting a little ahead of me there, John. Okay. So I'll, we'll, we'll slow you down there. I want to go back, though, to a couple of really big events from 2013 that have already been referenced, and I want everybody to comment on. First of all, and let's stick strictly now, if you would, please. Let's start with the government shutdown. I mean, Rob, what was your honest assessment when, when you found out that the government was shutting down? What, what did you think, not about the policy, just about the political impact of that? Um, well, uh, I can tell you what I thought, but I can tell you what happened. I, I'll get in less trouble if I tell you what happened. Um, uh, recruiting slowed to zero. 
No one wanted to return our phone calls. No one wanted to come to Washington and put their life on hold and move away from their family and um, generally uh, take a, some kind of either economic or domestic or hit to come to a place that looked so dysfunctional. Uh, fundraising dried up dramatically. Uh, no one wanted to give to a party. They would call us and say, fix this thing. And I wanted to send them a, that cartoon from the 80s a, that told you how a bill became a law and explained to them that the Republican Party has nothing to do with that process. But um, they were mad. And they said, you know, you idiots, you shouldn't be doing this. And uh, I looked at the polling. The polling said the American people thought we shouldn't be doing this. Um, even in our own Republican base, people thought this was a bad idea. Um, and the most compelling arguments I heard uh, for the reason for shutdown, um, politically speaking, didn't work. And they were a bad idea. And um, they didn't move one vote. They didn't change Obamacare one bit. Um, and they didn't get any more people on our side. So um, look, the American people, after we spent $4 billion between 2009 and 2012 to talk about Obamacare, the American people understand the red team doesn't like Obamacare, and the blue team does like Obamacare. So a shutdown, politically speaking, was awful for us. The generic took a nine-point hit uh, overnight. And um, uh, it was probably the, the only time I felt, you know, I got lucky early on. I actually had a friend of mine send me a PowerPoint or a, a, a presentation the Democrats were giving about how they were going to hold the Senate. This was early on. So I always had a comfort, and I can explain if you're interested why, that, that we were in a good place. But that was the one time that I actually um, doubted whether we were going to be able to accomplish our first goal, which is find candidates who can win general elections. Um, because, uh, you know, Scott Brown, Ed Gillespie, um, uh, folks we were in serious discussions with just weren't interested um, in a party that shut down the government. Raul, Jen, um, I mean, were you guys like dancing in the streets when they shut the government down? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that um, we identified the, the strategy uh, behind that um, from our perspective, but we were uh, pleased uh, that, you know, I mean, not we weren't pleased, obviously, we're never pleased if the government shut down. Um, but from a purely political um, perspective, I think, you know, it, it, it seemed to us um, to be an opportunity, uh, a place to show. Um, you know, the differences uh, and, and, and values and, and why um, we really felt um, like we had an opportunity to communicate out there why people should be getting engaged. And, um, you know, and frankly, I think all of us struggle, um, whatever side we're on, to communicate about right now um, why uh, government is good sometimes um, and why things can move and happen even aside from uh, something as extreme as, as the shutdown. So, you know, while from our perspective it certainly didn't hurt us politically, I don't know that it helped uh, across the board, um, you know, just because of, of, in particular, many of our activists, many of the people that had supported the president uh, early on um, who really felt like things could change um, and really wanted to be part of that and believed it was possible. And I think that this just added to that idea that, that maybe it's just never possible, it's too broken. Um, so it, it had pluses and minuses from our perspective. Yeah, and I, I definitely would say I think it added to the to the apathy of the, of the general voter out there that <clears throat> this was you know uh, something that shouldn't have been done. It was done, um, and and uh, you know further legitimizing the argument that you know everything's broken there. Uh, on the flip side, it did also help uh, for us uh, on, on our side the, with with the fundraising aspect of it all, um, and we were able to use that. Uh, to, to, to uh, fundraise and, and get good numbers. Um, and then uh, and to Jen's point, you know, the activists and folks to get people motivated to actually get out there, uh, recruit more volunteers, uh, and, and, and uh, get people excited about different campaigns, uh, it was definitely helpful for us. Okay, I wanna get some of the reactions from, from the rest of you. What was, your, what was your assessment politically, not getting into the policy and everything, just politically, what was your assessment of how this would play out? I can jump in, uh, putting the Congress hat back on. Uh, and this is actually. Um, Put this your is gonna, microphone back away oh, from me a little bit, away. Patrick. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I don't a little, little loud. All right. Um, I, don't, I don't want this to seem like I told you so, but I, I actually thought, I, I thought it, was a, it was a horrible moment. It was inside game versus the outside game. It had to happen internally for Congress because there was just so much pressure welling up 
inside of the Republican Party. And uh, if it, there had to be some expression of that frustration from the conservatives. And it was a hugely damaging episode. The fact that it happened a year out from the election, I think, gave Republicans time to repair. I didn't know how lasting it would be, but I think it created a dynamic in the party that proved in the long run to be very helpful, that being it motivated a group of Republicans heretofore who had not been very present in Republican primaries and had kind of let the activist wing steer the party in the direction that they wanted to through these, uh, these primaries. I, I'm not going to say they won, you guys won the majority because of the shutdown. I do think it was a really damaging episode, but I do think it animated a group of Republicans who had, at that point, been kind of sitting on their hands, bemoaning the fact that Republicans they didn't agree with from an ideological perspective because maybe they were asking too much or they were, uh, the demand that we shut the government down to defund Obamacare just seemed extreme and it certainly showed in all of our polling. I mean, you could really break out who were the kind of quote unquote Tea Party Republicans, who are the, as we define them, non-Tea Party Republicans. But it kind of put everybody on high alert, like we really need a change. And I think, you know, Rob and party leaders had been very sensitive to this dynamic for a long time. But the shutdown, I think, kind of woke everybody up to the fact that, wow, this party really will, is at war with itself. And if we don't intervene, we being these kind of more moderate, more mainstream Republicans don't intervene in the primary process, then, you know, who knows where we're going to go as a party. And I think 2014, especially the primaries, was a kind of, it was the establishment essentially flexing its muscles again and saying, hey, you know, we have a say here, we have more money and that we can win primaries and we can, you know, I think we're seeing it play out today. I don't know what the vote was in the House. I don't know what's going on, but uh, presumably if they avoided a shutdown, it's because uh, the Republicans have learned lessons from 2013 that that's probably not the way to uh, ingratiate yourself with American voters. You know, every now and again, something happens in politics where you just think you must be missing something. Um, because it makes so little sense that people are doing this, that <laughs> there's got to be something, and, and I don't think there is. Um, I, I really, and after the 2014 elections, there were tweets going out from prominent conservatives. The, the election results are proof that the shutdown worked. And I, I mean, I, I honestly don't know how to respond to that. I, I mean, <laughs> it, when you look back at the 95 shutdowns, um, you, you can kind of see what Republicans were thinking. I mean, Democrats had done a shutdown in 1990 that had brought President Bush to the table to, and ultimately resulted in the tax rate deal. That was right before an election. And so you, you, if you're Newt Gingrich, you're just coming off a big win. Bill Clinton actually did come very close to compromising with them and, and pulled back at the last minute. So that wasn't completely insane. But, but this, I mean, <laughs> It wasn't even going to accomplish the policy goal they wanted. I mean, they weren't shutting down Obamacare. Obamacare was going forward. Um, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what became amazing was, because I was actually back on the Hill at this point, is that even the people who were pushing it didn't really seem to know what they wanted the outcome to be. Uh, I mean, even the Ted Cruz's of the world, there was like a three or four day pause after it happened where they were kind of contemplating well, what did we just do and why did we do it? And there were seven or eight different reasons about, you know, what are we going to do next and why did we do this? And no one was really singing from the same songbook. And it was, I think it kind of reminded everybody, you know, this, this is not a responsible way for Congress <laughs> to, uh, to act. Yeah, I mean, but, if Obamacare checks weren't getting cut and they couldn't open the exchanges and, and you know, the subsidies, then you say, okay, I kind of understand what they're doing. Um, it, I don't think it's necessarily good politics, but, you know, you understand. But, but that, I mean, there, there was just, like, nothing good about it from yeah. a political perspective. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Well, you, they, you know what I think. Yeah, the amount of money that was wasted uh, to the taxpayers because of the tax, uh, because of the shutdown was is was is insane. Uh, I actually was in the administration at that point when it actually shut down, so I think I had like seven, eight days vacation. And essentially, that's what it was because a lot most people don't know that's what happened. Uh, once you came back to work, then you got paid for those days that you weren't there. So. Further, there's more money there that's wasted. Well, and that was all due to the. Well, I'll, I'll say this, which is that it, at the time it happened, it seemed like it'd be really bad for Republicans and good for Democrats. Republicans were having a hard time recruiting people and raising money. Democrats, on the other hand, were 
having a really easy time recruiting people because they thought all of a sudden the election would be better for them than, it, than, it, you know, than they initially thought. But here's the other interesting thing about the shutdown, which is that by the time campaign season actually rolled around in earnest this fall, there were very few Democratic TV ads that mentioned the shutdown at all. I mean, it was sort of like a forgotten issue by the time September, October rolled around. We were talking about Obamacare, we were talking about other things, but people seemed to forget a little bit about the government shutdown. Now, maybe it did matter in some respect, and it was just sort of baked into people's minds, and they didn't need to be reminded of it, but it was interesting, I thought, that it didn't seem to be part of you know, the issue conversation that, that we were having across the country. You know, what, just, just uh, what was interesting is li listening to the shutdown. I mean, I just think it just heightens the disconnect between Washington and the rest of the country. The rest of the country, we're out here in Kansas, which is great, great state. Um, but the rest of the country is so disconnected from what Washington thinks. And like we were in, in those 2013 elections, we had a lot going on in New York with some big county executive races, Nassau and Westchester suburbs. And, and in, same thing in Virginia. I was asking them, uh, were, you, were you negatively affected by the government shutdown? And you're getting like less than one in five voters were saying. And they really didn't care. And they, but they'd overwhelmingly tell you they dislike Washington. And you know, the Republican candidates in, the, in Nassau had a county executive get reelected 59-41. Westchester, the county executive, won the Republican. Demo and these counties have Democratic enrollment ends by 10 points. And in Virginia, the same thing. In Northern Virginia, they were telling us, more people were telling us they were negatively affected by Obamacare than they were by the government shutdown in Northern Virginia. So I just think you know, a lot of the shutdown talk, again, it's coming up. Yesterday, I had a, had a consultant from a southern state call me and asked me about because the congressman called him. And this guy works for him, runs his campaign. And the, and the congressman was asking him, what do you think? What are you hearing from locally about uh, this omnibus bill and the spending bill and a possible shutdown? And the consultant was like, what are they talking about? People in, people in the rest of the country aren't paying attention to this anymore. And the other part is they're not being hurt by what you know, and I'm glad the federal workers got paid, though. But you know, eventually, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's like it's the average person out there struggling, right. and and all this, you know, negative talk and dissonance is going on. And you're seeing an election where people walked away from it. More less people voted in 20, 2014 than they did in 2010. Right. In the midterms. If I anybody else wanted to jump real, in? Real, real quick. Yeah. I, and I, I'm actually almost a little bit of a question, but. Um, you know, I think one way it did matter was that there was this time period where there's the Obamacare rollout going on and the shutdown going on, and so there's kind of a competing narrative. No, we were happy we, the Obamacare rollout came after the shutdown. Well, <laughs> like, so the question is, what would, it, what would it have been if there hadn't been a shutdown, though? I mean, I, I think you almost certainly would have a Republican attorney general in Virginia, because I can believe the shutdown swung 200 votes in Northern Virginia. But what about like the governor's race? I mean, do you think that might have turned out differently if there hadn't been some shifting of the baseline from a shutdown? I think there was more of a perception. It almost became like the Republicans pulled their ads at the end of the campaign for the, I mean, for the governor's race. I think the perception was, and I wasn't pulling in the governor's race or the attorney general's race, um, but the Republicans pulled their ads before the end because they they saw like what they must have been seeing what the uh, media polls saw. You know, I've seen. Republicans talk about the analytics predicted Christie's win. Well, that wasn't hard. And I, never, <laughs> I, I never saw any analytics on the Virginia race. And to me, what, you know, it's like, uh, um, I, th I think uh, uh, the environment around it becomes like a, we all get a consensus. We look at media polls we respect. We, we hear about other polls and see other polls in the parties we respect. And you, you think it's worse than it looks. And, in the end, the voters, they like to surprise us. And uh, so I, I think, uh, I think, and the other two is, just because the polls say that on a given day doesn't mean they're going to be right. I mean, it, there's plenty of polls that you've got, when I mentioned to you, when you're looking at the undecideds and two-thirds happen to be unfavorable or disapprove the job the president's doing or disapprove Obamacare, they're undecided, well, it's not hard to get them to swing for you if you have a good message and you have a way to get it out there. So uh, um, in a way, the Republicans, like I said, we get smart when we're, after we lose. We lost bad in 2012. We got smart and did what we had to do to win in 2013 and did what we had to do 
uh, you know, I'm talking about the House of Delegates, the governor's race and the attorney general's race. I wish they'd done some more, you know, just being on the uh, just being on the air at the end with the right ads might have helped them win. But um, but as far as uh, uh, as far as having our backs to the wall in 2013 and then hope hoping for the you know a lot of the polls going. This is jumping ahead. Bill will rein me back in, but. You know, until the end, I've heard you say until the end, they weren't sure how it was going to go in 2014, a lot of these races. So, yeah, we'll get into listening, that. Listening to that Kansas tomorrow. panel, you know? It's yeah. Like, um, if I remember correctly, if I have my dates right, it was October 1 when the government shut down. Uh, they come back about the 17th, and all of a sudden the narrative, this has been mentioned before, the narrative really starts to change dramatically. Um, Rob, what did you see over at the Senate committee when the focus shifted? from the shutdown to the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. What, what did you witness and how long did, the, did it take that impact to show up? Um, you know, inside DC the impact was immediate, but um, we started seeing the impact on generic ballot and, and polling and incumbents who were heavily identified, um, Landrew, Hagan, um, Merkley, um, with Obamacare, or, or Anne Shaheen. Um, they started, you started to see them take on that water. Um, and you started to see the president's numbers go down, um, in particular on Obamacare, but it just had an overall drag on, on his uh, job approval, um, which led to some really uh, important factors. One, um, you saw the outside groups really hone in on this. Um, I heard in the previous panel a complaint about negative ads and outside groups. The perverse effect of the McCain-Feingold and coordination laws um, with regards to FEC enforcement mean that it's really hard to do positive. Um, they're trying to find ways to do more of it, but, um, and Obamacare was something that was very tangible, very exciting to the donor base, uh, and it was moving numbers. So you saw um, Freedom Partners and some other groups really latch on to um, the idea of Obamacare and tying it directly back to candidates. Um, which has a host of things that, that occur. Obviously, it, it weakens the Democrat candidates and encourages our recruitment. Um, and it helped us put an episode, you know, shutting down the government anytime is bad, but October, politically and, and media speaking, you're going into Thanksgiving, Christmas, January, really kind of slow news times. And we were going to chew on this thing for months if we didn't have something else that was going to take its place. And uh, Obamacare and the rollout and all those, you know, mistakes um, really kind of put a real firm end cap. So when the government kicked back into gear and the Obamacare rollout was as clunky as it was, um, it allowed us to kind of like politically or psychically cleanse our mind of what had just occurred and kind of focus on what was occurring. Um, and that was very helpful. Uh, you know, our contributions went back in line again with historic numbers of fundraising, you know, recruitment. Uh, we were able to get on an offensive message. Um, our senators, you know, really the one, and I, and I should have mentioned this, another positive we didn't discuss was um, you really saw leadership say, you know, Dan the Torpedo was full speed ahead, Mitch McConnell was in a full-blown primary, and he took some really tough votes because he said, we're not doing this again. And you saw him really step into the breach, and John Cornyn and some of these other senators took really tough votes that in a primary situation they didn't want it to take. Um, to not have that policy outcome we saw with the shutdown. And not that they didn't work hard during that shutdown, but I'm just saying you saw them make a firm commitment to the party, the, the base, uh, the, the, you know, the nation, that we weren't going to be in that situation again. And, they, and I can't remember the votes, but I remember they took some really tough procedural votes that uh, they were attacked for, but they did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, but then, you know, Obamacare, you saw all of our senators finally had something that they understood um, they were comfortable talking about, and it didn't involve shutdown. And you just saw them all out on the floor, and you saw them on TV and just attacking and, and focused, and and that was good to get. You know, we always talked about which was a majority mentality. You know, that we can do this, and um, we have to act like we're prepared to govern, and we have to act like we're ready to take over the government and run the government. We're we're the adults in the room, and that was a great moment for us. That three months after. Now we always said. I don't think Obamacare is going to be a major issue at the end of the election. I've, it was always my fundamental belief. We spent $4 billion talking about Obamacare the previous three years. Um, but I, I just thought if we could get, you know, I, if it lasted through the spring, great. If it lasted through the summer, awesome. Um, but um, our campaigns weren't built around Obamacare, but it sure was nice to have that break after uh, the shutdown. 
What was the Democratic perspective on, on that sudden kind of narrative shift from the spotlight <laughs> being on the Republicans for shutting down of the government to being on the administration? What's the opposite of dancing in the street? <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, look, it totally sucked. Um, and, you know, I think it had a significant impact. I think it stopped the discussion about the shutdown. It stopped our ability to be proactive and be on the attack. Um, it, you know, really was, you know, look, it's, it's no secret to anyone that Obamacare has not been something that we uh, figured out on the Democratic side how to communicate about from day one. Um, and I think that's probably an understatement. All along, though, you know, the sort of saving grace that we thought was, well, when people start getting enrolled, when people are part of it, it's going to get a lot better. It's a lot easier to tell the story. Um, and that story got really hard to tell when, the, uh, you know, something that was out of the control of a lot of us on the political side, um, you know, really just got in the way of that. So it affected, um, you know, our ability to be on the attack. It affected us trying to fix this and, and um, triage. It affected the senators um, and how they had to position themselves. It put all of them in a bad spot. Um, and it started a dialogue of process in a way that you don't really ever want to be in a discussion about process when you're an incumbent, when you want to go home and you want to talk about values and, and issues. You don't want to talk about um, you know, uh, where you stand with the president, where you don't. Is he going to be part of your campaign? Is, are you going to let him in your state? You know, what are you doing to solve this? How can you be involved? It just changes. Um, the dynamics of the discussion in a way that it took, um, you know, a lot of communication, a lot of effort, and, and I think allowed us to um, be taken off our game. Um, and, you know, I think we came back from that. I think we also agreed, um, we certainly mm -hmm. saw the point when things started moving forward, people enrolled, it became a, a, a less of a story when it got back on track. But that window of time um, didn't just affect us in that window of time. The, the effects of it certainly carried through in different ways to the end of the election. Yeah. And I, I would just add, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the opposition, they did, they did a really good job in staying on message and saying this is not working. I have people in my constituents in my district that are, you know, their insurance is going up. And they just hammered and hammered and hammered away at all of these hearings. And, you know, the secretary from the great state of Kansas, you know, you could tell when she was up there testifying was, you know, getting fr frustrated and saying, look, that's not, that's not the case. Um, but they just kept uh, going and going and, and, and staying on that message. And so, you know, as, as Jen said, it, it sucked. And uh, it was, I think, a turning point for, for us. And, uh, you know, when you're not, uh, when you're having to be, you know, on, on defense and not offense, you're, you're, it's not a good thing to, to, to be in that position. So. What were some of the rest of your thoughts when the narrative started to change? Bill, I think this was the most consequential period of the whole cycle um, for this reason. Uh, not simply because it focused on the problems of, of the health care law. Um, you know, as Rob said earlier, people had made up their minds about this law even before this happened. Uh, this probably hardened attitudes about it, but, uh, but the, the, the Obama administration has never been able to sell the, the Affordable Care Act in the way they had hoped or certainly haven't been up to now. But why I think this was so important was it, it brought attention back to the president and the competency of the president because it coincided, if you recall, maybe within a month or six weeks, of the, the red line on Syria and the decision ultimately not to go strike uh, in response to the use of chemical weapons. So you had a series of events that came together in the, in the late part of 2013 that raised questions about um, President Obama's strength, President Obama's leadership, President Obama's competence, uh, and, um, you know, as Jen alluded to earlier, this issue of uh, whether government could work. And if a Democratic president could not make government work, it was going to make it very, very difficult to defend or advocate for laws in which government was a big factor. So that I think that when you, when you got to the end of 2013 as a result of what happened with the, with the health care rollout, the president's numbers were way, way down and obviously did, did not recover. Um, and in, 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 a, in, a, in an important way, set the stage for a midterm election uh, in the sixth year of a presidency that we are used to, which is uh, the, you know, the president's party on the defensive. There are lots of things that happened after that that we will talk about, but I think that that, that period was critical in establishing the foundation upon which both sides were trying to build or, or not after that. 
And let me just give one piece of data to support the fact that government not working was a driver here. We, we've asked both in 2010 and in 2014 in the exit poll, do you think government should do more to solve problems or do you think government is doing too many things that are left to business and individuals? And both in 2010 and 2014, the, it was always government should do less. Uh, in 2014, it ended up being 54% versus 41%. And I think the, the, the rollout of, of the healthcare.gov helped reinforce that opinion. I mean, at the same time, our exit poll showed that people that voted because of healthcare actually voted Democratic in 2014. But it was an issue that the Democrats couldn't push because the overall thought process that government should do less, that when government gets involved, it doesn't work. That is ingrained enough in the electorate that all the things that healthcare.gov, or the healthcare um, program is doing to lower the number of uninsured Americans, the Democrats couldn't even go there to make that argument because in it, the, the, the electorate has become uh, antsy about anything that government does. And I think that rollout helped reinforce that. Other thoughts on this topic, Sean? I, I remember the, the morning of the Obamacare rollout. One of my friends on Facebook, who's a huge advocate uh, for the ACA, had a post. It's a picture of the 404 window. He's like, wow, lots of people are signing up for Obamacare now. They overwhelmed the server. And well, no, it's six. Um, but, but that, you know, I, I, I think they're right that this was, Nancy Pelosi drew a lot of heat for her comment about we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it. But it, it was, it's, it's, Oh, in an artful way of saying, of saying something which is true, which is that it's a massively complex bill and so you don't really know what's going on with it until it gets implemented. And it's, I, I think that the rollout was, an, was a crucial opportunity for Democrats because everyone was focused on it. It was a big deal and if the first day of Obamacare had been, wow, you know, three million people signed up for health care while the Republicans are shutting down Congress trying to stop this wonderful thing from being implemented, you, I, I personally believe you'd have a completely different narrative for the entire campaign. I think the president might have stayed at around 50 percent, and I think Democrats might have held the Senate. Um, I, I, you know, maybe I'm being too apocalyptic there. You know, we don't have, you know, we don't have a God's eye view of the world, so we don't know all the um, counterfactuals, but I, I think you can, as best as we can make a case, that's the case to be made. Okay. Any other thoughts on this topic? No, the, go ahead. I was going to say is, you know, is it, you go back to the 2013 polling, in a way we were telling candidates this was baked in like 2006. 2006, the Iraq war got a 54 disapproved, President Bush's disapproval became 54, the Democrats got 54% of the vote, took the House and Senate. And looking at Obamacare, like you said, Rob already said it was baked into it, 2013 you saw it in the polls, where the Republicans were saying we're going to repeal and replace it, they were almost you know, their primaries were going to be about who was tougher on Obamacare and who would repeal and replace it. And, and when, you, when you think of that, it, it became a symbol the Republicans took the House on a check and balance message against the President in 2010, and they were setting up to win again on a check and balance message that we would be able, not just on, a, not just on Obamacare, but Obamacare it, when the rollout didn't work. And it wasn't the fact that you couldn't go on a website and sign up. That just became the symptom. It was really that people were telling you every time their premiums went up, or they lost health care, or, or, or their employers were raising their premiums, their employers were actually saying, you're going to have to contribute more because the premiums are going up. So, and, it's used, and for a lot of workers, it was something they never had to contribute to. So when people were telling us that in polls and focus groups, you could just see that vote was baked in. It was literally there. And then it became a jumping off point for other issues. And, and really it didn't have to, you know, you, you, it was just assumed part of the fabric. And that's where his job disapproval started reversing. Patrick? Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo Dan's point. I mean, I do think it was a really critical moment. And one, I'll just say, I don't know that it dawned on me for why immediately, but speaking for the Wall Street Journal NBC News polling, President Obama spent most of the year in a pretty comfortable place. I mean, he was kind of shaky, but this was the moment that it all, it changed so fast and it changed in such a fundamental way. It wasn't just his approval rating that all of a sudden started to descend. It was the trust, 
even when Obama was not popular, voters have a tendency to really trust him and like him. And that had been a very durable theme throughout his presidency, just based on our numbers. And it just collapsed like that. Uh, you really saw it with independent voters, but you even started to see some very early, and these were very subtle moves, but uh, you saw him, the support for him erode among traditional uh, democratic constituencies, African Americans, young people, women. They, you, we started to see that move subtly. Independence, it was just he dropped off a cliff, um, but it was the trust issue. And I think, as Dan mentioned, that was also because of Syria. But once you had the health care rollout, people were asking questions of the president in ways that they just hadn't to that point. And I think Republicans had been making the attacks for years, but all of a sudden people seemed to just be more receptive to them. And I don't know that it really reversed itself. I, I would have to go look at our numbers. But I, I think once he turned that corner, he kind of never came back. Yeah, and that lack of enthusiasm ended up being expressed in the exit, but we do ask a question, you know, are you enthusiastic, you support Obama, but you, are you enthusiastic? And that enthusiasm number went down to 10% in the 2014 exit poll. So even though his approval rating hung on at 44%, it wasn't a very enthusiastic support by election day. And I think that's part of it. It's harder to defend something that's perceived not to be working and that even his defenders were less enthusiastic about it. Okay, I've got one more question, then we'll open it up to uh, your questions and answers for the audience before we conclude this afternoon's question. But, Rob, we're going to lose you due to a previous commitment tomorrow. But I think we want to talk a little more about, we'll talk about a couple specific Republican primaries tomorrow, but I want you to get into in a little bit more depth this afternoon before we conclude and then get reactions to it. I think, I think it was Alex or Joe, and I'm sorry, guys, I forget, who made the very good point that over the last two election cycles, Arguably, Republicans lost three to five seats in the Senate because they nominated the wrong candidates. What was the, the, the Senate strategy for the party in terms of getting the right candidates nominated and in terms of making sure that you retain those incumbents that you didn't have any repeats like uh, uh, Bob Bennett or uh, Dick Luger? Yeah. Um, well, for the incumbents, it was uh, talk to them early, uh, do an analysis of them. I don't know um, how it is on the Democratic side, but the senators don't like it when you research them. <laughs> they kind of resist that. Um, so it was making the, the choice to uh, kind of break a code and say, well, we're going to look into you and see where your residency is and see where some other stuff is. Um, cash on hand is the where usually as far as the research would go, and that's a public number. And uh, um, so a lot of it was just preparing the incumbents. And, and by and large, um, they did a pretty good job. Um, you know, with the for-profit conservatives that we wrestle with and um, um, on our side and I've warned, warned Joel Benison in previous conversations that is coming once the Democrats lose their White House um, uh, because the way the campaign system works is that um, you know you're gonna have very wealthy folks who think you're not X enough on X issue and they're just gonna give someone five million dollars and all of a sudden you know what we've been wrestling with uh, the, the length of the Obama presidency um, will, I think, move on to the Democrat Party just because it's the natural evolution of campaign finance and the un unintended consequence of a, of a poorly um, executed law. Um, that said, um, our philosophy was always a very boa constrictor mentality, which was um, groups that raise five, ten, twenty million dollars a cycle. Um, you're not going to cut their head off. You're not going to put them out of business. Um, but also, you can't work with them because we saw during government shutdown. Um, and we've seen subsequently, every time you try to appease them, they just move the goal line and say, oh, well, that's where conservatives were yesterday, but now we've redefined what a conservative is, and you're not it. So if you get to that, re that new definition, they just redefine it again. Because if the NRSC goes out of business, they go out of business. So they don't have something to bounce off and say, trust us, send us your dollars. Um, uh, we're going to be the, the, the guardians of the Constitution against those rhino Republicans over at the NRSC. Um, they don't exist. Now, I'll tell you, there's a three-story townhouse in Washington, D.C. It's lovely. I'm told I haven't been inside. It has a rooftop deck. has a wine cellar. They rent a $17,000 a month. And I've never heard of one candidate training. I've never heard of one meet and greet. I've never heard of a fundraiser at this place. Um, but it, the rent's paid every month. And uh, someone works there. This organization, Senate Conservative Fund, 
They blocked us every chance they could. They challenged us on every front. And it wasn't about policy. They, su they supported candidates that earmarked. They supported candidates who fought tort reform. They supported candidates who uh, lost their medical license, were involved, involved in charitable fraud. They supported candidates who, um, uh, six weeks before the election, were, uh, uh, had a $400,000 fine levied against them for investor fraud. Um, this candidate didn't get in, but they supported a candidate who declared on his uh, announcement for Senate that America was drowning in a sea of debt. He had filed for bankruptcy in 2010. Owed American Express $486,000, the federal government $54,000. This is who they support, yet talk radio and the, the reinforcers of this um, money machine spent $23 million attacking our candidates and then forcing us to, to, to respond. Um, this is how they conduct themselves, and this is the fraudulent nature. Um, there are groups that have been involved in uh, veteran-related charitable fraud um, that DOD has never heard of that run political operations that get millions of dollars from well-meaning folks who get a solicitation over email or mail, phone call, and say, you know, we want to move the country. We don't like Obama. We don't like this. You can tell it's a pretty powerful theme in my life these days, but I spent 18 months fighting these groups, and if these groups did this in the business world, they'd all go to jail. This is straight up fraud. They know it. Um, they put these candidates into debt. Uh, they force us to spend millions of dollars, and it's because we have this broken campaign finance system that allows individuals to give unlimited checks, undisclosed, um, or um, it allows these groups to operate outside the party. Um, in a real and, and significant way. Now, not all the outside groups are bad actors, and some of the conservative groups that fought us aren't bad people, and they have good motives. Um, but there's a significant portion of our movement that is all about profit, it's all about making salaries, it's all about people getting contracts and sweetheart deals, and um, it's, it's a really ugly part of the business we're in. And I'm not sure how we could curtail it, other than the strategy, which I'll get back to. I'm um, rant over. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ken, sorry. Um, but our strategy was, how do we constrict them? And the quickest way to, to kill um, bad actors is to make them losers. And so we had to beat their candidates, and we did every year. It cost us a lot of money. Um, uh, but we saw it firsthand. When we didn't win back the Senate, our donors didn't want to give us money. When we shut down the government, even though we were for the government being open, our folks didn't want to give us money. So we had to make sure that these bad actors didn't have candidates that won. Um, and a lot of times they thought it was ideological. They were too conservative or they were too hardcore on immigration. Nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with what Kansas Senator Jerry Moran said the first time I met with him. Candidates who can't win general elections are of no use to this committee. And that's the fundamental, that's the fundamental purpose of the NRSC, which is to elect more Republicans. So that was our strategy. Uh, we tried a brief period to talk with them, work it out, see if we could work together on some things. Um, they largely proved unreliable, um, unprofessional, and um, um, uh, used any information we gave them against us to raise money. So uh, it was war, and uh, we beat them. And it doesn't mean they're not going to come back, but it's incumbent upon um, the good actors to keep constricting them and to keep cutting off their money and uh, to keep forcing them into the fringes of uh, the political establishment. We're going to get into a couple of the primaries, most interesting primaries in the morning, but I just wanted to know if anybody else wanted to react to anything Rob had said or, or generally comment on what you saw that was different about Republican Party planning uh, on these Senate races to get the right candidates this time than you noticed previously. I, I just say from our end, I mean, um, because you had good candidates, you beat us. And, you know, we had some opportunities in you know previous elections, Missouri, um, that you know because of the the what you're describing and, and some of the internal fighting and um, you know l lack of mainstream uh, candidates that ended up winning uh, the nomination, it made really tough races a little bit easier for us. And you know certainly we hoped that that would be the case, <laughs> um, but it wasn't. And so when we had um, you know, mistakes or missteps, Iowa, I think, probably is a, a good example of that. Because we were going up against such a strong candidate, um, it made it really difficult for us to get our footing again um, and, and certainly um, had an impact on, on us in, in losing those races, but really didn't give us any opportunity to um, make the same arguments. And in fact, uh, I think we saw in some of our races that we tried to make some of these um, 
these extremist uh, arguments uh, land on our Republican uh, opponents, um, and they just weren't as credible because we weren't dealing with the same kind of candidates that we were in some states in, in 2010, and we, in fact, um, lost credibility in some ways because of that. Okay. Uh, we're going to open it up to your Q&A. If you've got a question, please raise your hand, and we'll have a microphone uh, with one of our students come by. We have one up here on the left. And do you have one in the, the back there, Zach? Okay, let's do, uh, well, Joy's first, I guess. He, he beat you to the punch there, Zach. Uh, I'm sure you guys will probably get to this a bit more tomorrow, but specifically talking about the environment leading up to the election, President Obama wasn't seen a lot right before the election. How did his presence affect the environment sort of in 2013 and 2014 leading up to that election cycle? If that makes sense. His presence, like on the campaign trail. Like just the way in which his presence was not necessarily his approval rating, but like how he interacted with voters, how he interacted with the public, and how that affected how people were going to vote in 2014. Well, I mean, from the Democratic side, uh, you know, it was certainly uh, discussed a lot uh, on the campaign trail, in particular in 2014. Is the president going to be out there? When's he going to be out there? Can Democrats hold the Obama uh, coalition? Um, you know, did you vote for the president? I mean, we had a number of, of questions that, that, you know, really, I think, um, dogged us and, again, you know, took us off track. You know, it's hard to it's hard to answer the question of if the president was out there more, our candidates would have done better or worse. At the core, from what we said from the beginning, and what I truly believe is, you know, this wasn't a national election. To the extent that we can make this local elections, that we can lean into the strength of our Senate incumbents who had really deep roots in their communities, that's where we were going to win. Um, and so, you know, it became almost a, a false choice question. I'm not sure that voters cared either way. Um, however, we definitely have um, motivation problems, in particular in midterms. You know, the turnout statistics are tough because across nationally, turnout was terrible. But if you look at big, the big battleground Senate races, turnout was better than it was in 2010. And the goal was never to make turnout what it was in 2012. These are very different electorates, and, and that's, that's a unicorn goal. Um, but we really did have some motivation challenges. So, you know, it's a tough question. I think you could probably analyze it a hundred different ways and come up with a different answer. I'm not sure it had a direct impact, but the fact that we talked about it so much that it was part of the dialogue that people had to answer to it, um, I think made it part of the campaigns more than we would want it to be. Yeah, and I, and we're, we're, we've, uh, at the Democratic Party, we uh, are gonna do a task force um, and that's, that's been formed and we're in the process of adding uh, people to that, but that's definitely going to be one of the questions and, and one of the topics that we look at and, and how that played. I will say that uh, the president did uh, campaign on a number of places in Rhode Island and uh, so on and so forth, but, um, and so in those places it, it was helpful. I, I also will say that there are p uh, candidates that are out there, I won't mention names, uh, but that have said, you know, in retrospect, we look back and we said he should, he should have been out here and he should have been helping our campaign because he, he would have been helpful. So, um, but you know, so there's two sides of every story. So you know, that's a, a big uh, question we're going to look at in the task force and see exactly how that played out. I'm sorry. In 2006, I was working. For, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, 2006, I was working for Eric Canner, as John said, and uh, you know, we kind of hid W, and. Um, um, I, you know, so I, I, we saw the similar echoes with, 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 with Obama. Um, I will say this, is that if Obama was out with an economic message, um, I think it would, uh, talking about let's not change horses midstream, we're almost out of the ditch, hang in there with us. Um, I think, it, I, I, you know, I'm going to reference Joel again. He put out a memo in March of 2013, or uh, 14, saying the Democrats should talk about the economy. And two weeks before the election, I was paying 260 for gas in Maryland. And I was like, whew, hope the rest of the world doesn't figure this out because uh, <laughs> yeah. I could win a lot of elections on cheap gas. Um, but uh, uh, that was, and I said it after the election, I think some people thought I was just trying to cause trouble, but I actually legitimately believe that Obama, as the chief spokesman on the economy, is getting better, just hang in there with us. Um, and I know it was at the end of a long summer of, you know, the border and uh, Syria and ISIS and the veterans thing. So it was like, I know there's a series of like, mm, do we want them coming in and, 
having to answer questions on all these tough issues. But um, I think uh, I think he's still your best spokesman. And, and I don't know if John, if you have any thought that you know at the end of the day, the president's still the president. And you can pretend like he doesn't exist, but he does. So you might as well put him to work. I guess it's kind of. I've, I've seen it. I've, I feel sorry for them because it's like it's really hard to tell the White House don't come. Yeah. And it's and they want to come because they're only hearing stuff from the White House. Like I remember, you know, going back to. 06, absolutely, with George Allen, we'd come back and we were up 10 points on October 15th and, and President Bush came in and all of a sudden, the day he was coming in, it fell to one point. And it was because the Iraq war. And so you're like, you go from 10 points up one night to one point on a presidential visit with all the attention around it. And then I get, you know, the, he was supposed to come in the last week and I'm like, well, we're going back up in the polls, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> We were under 50, but it's like next thing you know, I got Sarah Taylor from the White House yelling at me, like, "How are you going to get your vote out?" And I'm like, "I know who's going to come out. It's not our vote if you come back." And I went through this with Senator Helms in 1990. President Bush came in, first President Bush, 41 comes in, and he raised taxes that day. And <laughs> Senator Helms went from being a little ahead to six points behind, and they told me I wasn't going home unless they went back ahead. And uh, the president was supposed to come back again for another visit. And I was like, I was with Governor Morton. I said, can you scramble the National Guard to make sure Air Force One doesn't come over North Carolina? <laughs> so, so like, I would just say, I think the Democrats should have gotten President Obama out more <laughs> and to visit more states for us. You know, it, it goes up and down with the, with the president's approval and the message. Yeah. So what's yeah. going on at the time? And, and it's like you've, Senator Schumer clearly has laid out a post-election messaging for the Democrats that you know they now know what doesn't work and they're going to try to go in a different direction, make it harder for us. And every election is different. But uh, um, you know, I, I thought in some respects uh, when Michelle Obama was coming out in the trail, she was doing some good for them, and the president could have done some more good for them. And you're right. I'm glad you're on our side that you didn't tell them that point of the economic message. Okay, I want to move along and get to the next question. Uh, Rob, I was interested in your remarks about the fundraising that you had to fight. Uh, is this pretty much a bipartisan issue now, this Citizens United? And are we ever going to have meaningful campaign reform again? Is there any way of defeating uh, Citizens um, United? Campaign reform is a bipartisan dream. We just have, unfortunately, our paths to get there. So diverging, I don't see how we get there. Um, I'll characterize it my way, and, and they may characterize it differently. But um, they're for less money and more rules to keep money out. I'm for one rule, which is you just have to disclose it. So if you want to take a million dollar check, then you got to disclose it, and everyone has to be able to find it. Um, and just you know, have, have more of a Virginia-style system, which is the Virginia campaign system. Um, you know, there's some folks who say, let's have the government just subsidize all the campaigns. I think, I think that would give you worse candidates, because the one thing that keeps bad candidates out the best is having them have to be forced to sit down and ask their fellow citizen for an investment in their campaign. And I think it weeds out bad candidates. So if the government just handed a candidate a check, I think you'd have more, less capable candidates. But um, the Democrats, uh, I, I let them speak. I don't think they have, they, they haven't had as big a problem as we've had. Um, but the White House is a great central hub of control. We saw it when W was in the White House, that you can really control kind of the bad actors and the donors, you know, the donors, you have a little more hands on. Um, you know, we have no one leader in the party, no centralized power source. We have a lot of great leaders, but there's no president saying, don't do this. And once you don't have that, it kind of lends a free for all kind of environment that we've seen on our side. I don't know if Jennifer. I, I mean, if you, I don't know if you're seeing the, the beginnings of it, or you, I don't know if it's just you no, guys. No, I, I think. I mean, we certainly face it to a different extent, but um, I think the whole dynamic and the whole systems change. The fact that we're talking. I mean, Dan's article today, but you know, a billion dollars—that's the norm for what 2016 is going to be at a minimum, um, and that that cannot hold, and it cannot keep going in that direction. And at the same time, you know, you are seeing. Um, a real struggle with the institutions of the parties and who's building what and, you know, um, the idea that these outside groups are not only giving money to candidates, but they're building tools and they're building data and um, they're doing things that traditionally would sit with the institutions and what does that mean and what kind of influence can they have and who can run. So, you know, 
I, uh, I th I'm, I'm concerned, obviously, I think everyone that does this business is concerned. I don't think we can, either side can allow this to continue uh, apace. Um, I don't know how we find middle ground. Um, and I think it, it might, I mean, it requires all of you and, and voters to really prioritize this and think about a way that we can, um, you know, really figure out how to change the system. But I also don't think we have any good answers for changing the system either, especially yeah. as you describe them. Yeah, let me right. jump in and ask a follow-up to this because I think this is very, very important. If I understand, Rob, your point was that, and I think this fits exactly what Jen just said, that party committees, which are accountable because party committees exist on the Senate Campaign Committee of the United States Senators, of the DNC or the RNC, the National Committee Men, the Committee Women, the State Party Chairs. There are people all around the country who represent those committees. And you can go and you can latch on one, one of them and you can complain about what the party's doing spending money. Wasn't your point really that it wasn't Citizens United, but it was McCain-Feingold that really took that authority out of the party's hands and put it into the hands of these anonymous huge donors. That really was kind of the start of it, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it, it broke the link between the politicians and the political money, and that was the goal of it. But, you know, I understand one side of the goal, but the flip side is, is Kay Hagan uh, elected by the people of North Carolina to represent him, Tom Tillis <coughs> nominated by the Republicans um, to take on Kay Hagan. It's a $110, $115 million race. I think their combined spending was maybe 20, 25% of that total number. So, Imagine having an argument with your spouse and every fifth sentence you get to, or each of you get to say, and you have a bunch of people who are just watching you fight, four, four out of five of those uh, arguments are being set levied at you again by someone else. Um, it doesn't lend to probably a constructive uh, environment. And uh, um, look, in my lifetime, they've done everything they can to try and chase money out of politics, and all they've done is move it under the table, behind closed doors, in the dark. Um, so it's just my fundamental belief that if, if the party committees want to take a million dollar check uh, from a U.S. citizen or uh, even a corporation or union, or if a candidate wants to do that, as long as the voters know and they have access to the information and they have watchdogs um, in the media to alert the people that this is happening, um, then do it that way. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it would allow for more open system, um, exciting candidates, um, and we would, you also, um, you, you know, right now we're getting to a place, you know, we recruited all over the country, and if you're not relatively wealthy, you can't run for the U.S. Senate. Because no one can take a year off, a year and a half off to run for the U.S. Senate, uh, unless you're somewhat wealthy. Um, I'm not against success, but um, uh, when you have the average in, uh, 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 not income, uh, uh, net wealth of the U.S. Congress going up every year, it tells you there's another unintended consequence of campaign finance reform. Um, so. Uh, you know, that's, that, those are our challenges. Any other comments on that? The other thing is you got the Bill of Rights. You're going to ultimately, when you talk about campaigns, you're talking about the, the, this is the ultimate free speech running for office. And what, what Rob's talking about is at the end of the campaign, I have one congressional, Lee Zeldin was running against Tim Bishop on Long Island. You're sitting there going through what you're supposed to do, and you realize your candidate is only 10% of the money. The other 10, and Bishop is only 10%, and the other 80% is outside groups that you don't have any, you can't coordinate with, you can't, and, and so the candidates, was less so than the party, the candidates have lost control of their own campaigns. Yeah. And, and ultimately, the ones who are in play are the ones that the party is helping because they can add some more resources. But I agree with Rob, it's like in Virginia, you have more transparency. And ultimately, I've had candidates call up, should we take $100,000 from Pat Robertson? I'm like, well, they're going to attack us for Pat Robertson anyway. So, but it's all reported. It's all on the books. It's all open and honest. And right now, people don't know where it's coming from. And the worst part is if you're going to run for public office, most of the resources spent for or against you at the end are beyond your control. And it's not even the media anymore that has the impact because people go everywhere else to look for information. So. Don't remind me. I know. <laughs> now, can somebody clarify just a little bit more um, the amount of money? What's the problem? Is the money coming in, is it corporate money that you're talking about, or is it this unlimited individual money that is really the big part of all these groups right now? Well, candidates and party committees can't accept corporate money um, or union money, right? Like, I mean, you, guys, <laughs> you, I mean, you can get union PAC money, right. but you can't. Yeah. Right. Um, so so it's it's... it's uh, 
on the Republican side, more 501c4, but also super PACs that are accepting individual, corporate, and union huge, large checks, so, you, know, you know, six, seven, eight figure checks. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, well, it's my philosophy that you're not going to keep money out of politics, so you might as well just open it up and um, have people who are actually asking for the vote responsible for the spending that's in their race, or at least more, more responsible. I'll just add one point to that, um, and that is the other problem with this is that the, the more money that is spent, the more there is a disconnect with the average voter, and the more there is a perception among voters that in one way or another the system is A, stacked against them, and B, corrupting. Um, you know, it's hard to prove direct or whatever, but we know what public perceptions are of these things. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think Jen's point, which is this is in some ways an unsustainable system that we are building cycle by cycle, and not because you can't go out and necessarily raise more money. I mean, although we'll see whether in 2016 people can raise what was raised in 2012, but the assumption is that there will be more money raised in 2016 than 2012. Um, but the more that is raised um, and the more that that is put into TV ads that ultimately people stop watching well before the election, uh, it just contributes to the idea that we have a broken system. And I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know that anybody around this table has a way to quite reel it back in a sensible way, given First Amendment, given the state of the Supreme Court, given the differences between the two parties, given the differences between incumbents and challengers. I mean, there are so many obstacles to this. Um, but we, we know that it has become a kind of a poisonous problem that's contributed to the sense of dissatisfaction with the way Washington works. Okay, we're going to go to our next question right here. Uh, in the current political climate, what would it take for Congress, the President, and the states to make and implement effective public policy and to govern the country well? <laughs> Depends if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Right. <laughs> and that actually is the answer, and that's the problem. I mean, it, the, 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 my philosophy, my answer to all the things we see right now is that Democrats want to make chili, and Republicans want to make vegetable soup, and if you put them together, it just makes a disgusting mix, a mess. Um, you know, people talk about compromise, but, but what's the compromise? I mean, the top tax rate is 39%. Say a Democrat wants to raise it to 45% and a Republican wants to lower it to 34%. Well, what's the compromise? Is it raise it to 42%? Well, then the Democrats sort of win. Is it raise, lower it to 37%? Well, you know, do Democrats really think that's a good compromise? No. Um, we've just become so polarized as a country, and not just in terms of the candidates we run, but in terms of people, in terms of where we live. If, if you look at the map, the electoral map from 1960, everything's purple. There's, that's not entirely true, but it, it, most of the, 34 states were within five points of the national margin. Um, and if you look at the map of Virginia in 19, or even better, if you look at Alabama and Tennessee and Arkansas, and Mississippi and Kentucky, it's a sea of blue, believe it or not, because Bill Clinton was winning a bunch of rural Democrats. And if you look at it today, there are little dots of blue. And if you know your geography, you can say what cities those are that Barack Obama was carrying. Um, and so I, I, that, that's the problem is that we can't compromise because people have radically different visions now of where they think the country should go. Um, and I don't know what you do about it. Yeah, I mean, the only your way to get policy going in a different direction is for one side to win convincingly. And with all this money on both sides, that's not going to happen. The well, way convincingly the election, and consistently. And consistently. And that's, that's the other issue. We talk a lot about 130 million people vote in a presidential election, and that is trending Democratic for a lot of reasons. And only 82 million people vote in a midterm election, and that in a lot of ways is trending Republican. So you have this seesaw effect where in a presidential year, Democrats have a little bit of an edge, and the midterm year, Republicans have a little bit of an edge, and that check and balance is going to go back and forth and not give a clear and consistent result for any one, any one policy to go. I mean, you're not going to have what you had for the New Deal, Democrats winning both the Congress and the presidency for 20 years. That's not, that hasn't happened in a long time and probably won't happen for, for a long time as well. So you got to figure out a way to have policy in this 
error where one side's going to win a little and then the other side's going to win a little, and no one's ever going to win consistently and convincingly. It's real. I mean, look at Obamacare. The left is absolutely convinced that Barack Obama gave away the farm uh, with, with implementing the Republicans' um, uh, ideas from 1994. And the right is like, are, are you kidding me? It's $2 trillion in new health care spending. Of course that's not something we like. I mean, even on something like Obamacare, where the left thinks they're compromising, the right is like, this, this is crazy that we would get on board with something like that. Now, 30 years ago, that might have been a real compromise. But even Obamacare, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty far step to the left from what status quo ante was. So I, I just, But the problem isn't just the big issues, it's the small issues. And I think that cer certainly in my lifetime, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, the idea of, of parties working together on, on anything is not possible right now. And that to me, the answer can't be just one side winning consistently. And, and w there has to be a way that the civility comes back and that on things that are um, you know, not fundamental core differences, but naming post offices. I mean, I'm sure we can't even have bipartisanship on that. So to me, there has to be some other answers. And, and I, I, I certainly think that um, it's the polarization, but it's, it's also um, uh, the extreme perspective of um, the damage politically people perceive in the parties of just working together, it, it no longer being bipartisan, that, that's not seen as a political advantage. It's seen as a weakness. And I think that, you know, I don't know the answer to fixing it, but that has to be solved just for democracy itself. Uh, and certainly not going to be solved at this panel, I don't think, in general. I mean, it's going to take a lot of people to figure it out, but I think that the, the issue is, is uh, much bigger, even on the small things. I have time for one last question. If somebody wants, you got it, Zach? Go for it. I want to ask, uh, we've talked a lot about Affordable Care Act. What would, I mean, it's kind of asking you to be speculative, but if, if Ted Kennedy had lived a few more years and been able to usher that through the Senate, you think we'd be in a whole different political environment? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's an impossible thing to answer. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that you know he represents uh, certainly um, someone that was uh, at many times known for um, working across party lines and finding um, partners that would be willing to do that. But obviously, just the sheer nature of moving that through the process um, and and the ability to do that, you know, would be of a, a benefit. But um, I don't know that uh, he could have. Um, you know, prevented the rollout from failing. <laughs> I, I think one way it would have mattered is that there wouldn't have been a Scott Brown if Ted Kennedy um, hadn't died. Yes. Um, and I think the Democrats probably would have gone back and tweaked some things in the Affordable Care Act, especially with the language and the subsidies that people started to notice afterwards, which I think is going to be a big problem in a few months for both sides. Um, so, but but I, I think the the narrative of the hundred eleventh whatever the number is, uh, goes different in the second half, sans Scott Brown. Okay, well, uh, we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30. We'll be talking a little bit more about the uh, Tea Party versus the GOP establishment and what happened in the elections, and we'll get into some of these other topics again tomorrow, maybe in a little bit more depth, like the electorates, but uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, and please join with me in thanking our panelists for this wonderful discussion. And I hope all of you can join us tomorrow. And for the friends who will be at the dinner tonight, you're in for a really special treat. We look forward to seeing you there. So thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.